top stories tonight. Commuters stranded as heavy downpour floods Lagos State. Southeast Senators urge President Tinubu to release Namdi Kanu. Oshu State Governor suspends senior special assistant and civil societies for alleged misconduct. Four Chinese killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo militia attack. Thank you for joining us. I'm Felicity Ezewike. Let's begin by telling you that Nigeria will experience some pretty chaotic weather situation. The Meteorological Agency has predicted thunderstorms and rains from Wednesday to Friday across the country. Nimet's weather outlook released in Abuja predicted morning thunderstorms on Wednesday over parts of Jigawa, Kanu, Katsina, Shokoto, Kebi, Zamfara, Taraba, and Adamawa states. Thunderstorms are expected over parts of the Federal Capital Territory, Kwara, Kogi, Plateau, Denwe, and Niger states in the north central in the morning. Later in the day, thunderstorms are expected over parts of Plateau, Nasarawa, Niger, Niger, I beg your pardon, Kogi, Kwara, the Federal Capital Territory, and Benue states. According to Nimet, morning rains are expected over parts of Lagos, Ondo, Delta, Ogun, Abia, Rivers, Edo, Akwaibom, and Cross River states in the southern region. It anticipated high prospects of continuous rains for Lagos, which might lead to flooding. In April, Lagos State Commissioner for Environment and Water Resources, Tukumbo Wahab, issued a warning that the state is set to face abnormal rainfall this year. According to Wahab, a total of 1,936.2 millimeters, millimeters predicted rainfall has been predicted for the state. Now, this can be backed by the amount of rain seen in the last few days accompanied by lots of floods in Lagos State. I'm now joined by Bettina Welly, who went around some areas in the state for an on-the-spot assessment after flooding. Bettina, it's good to have you on the news. You, you went around town. What stood out about today's rain in Lagos? Well, um, so let's say good evening. First of all, I would say that the volume of rain is something that stood out this time around. It, uh, even though the rain didn't fall for quite a long time, but the volume of rain that fell is the reason why we have floods, accompanied by the uh, non-talentness of Lagosians when it comes to taking care of the environment and clogging the drainages. But uh, don't let me say too much. Let's see the package and let's see what Lagos was actually like earlier today. All right, we can have the package now. This week, Lagos has been battered by relentless rain and severe flooding, throwing daily life into chaos and sparking serious concerns. The torrential downpours began early Monday morning and have hardly let up since, inundating several parts of the state no and way. causing widespread disruption. It's not even possible, no. The process of converting the wetland into livable space was done in many areas exceedingly irresponsibly. But the process of that reclaiming now impacted so negatively on the capability of that wetland to get rid of the water when the heavy rains come, because that's what the wetlands were doing in years gone by. But we now went and broke that cycle in many areas in Leki by blocking what should have been natural areas for passage of the rainwater. Vehicles that cannot withstand the pressure of the rain break down, contributing to the already abnormal traffic. New Central's correspondent reported severe flooding at Yanawaru Olupumeji triggering a massive traffic snarl stretching all the way to Alakpere bus stop, Wemco Junction in Agege, and in Shomolu. 
The economic fallout is staggering. Markets and businesses in the hardest hit areas are closed, resulting in crippling financial losses. While some flooded areas and canals are finally being cleared, experts argue that a proactive approach could have mitigated this disaster. But what you sow is what you reap. So you, individual out there, for your neighbor's sake, do not throw your plastic on the road again. Even if you have to put it in your pocket, put it in your pocket. My God, until you find somewhere where you can put those little plastic bags in a safe place, some kind of dustbin like this. Because if you throw it on the road, it's going to go and block the drain. That can now cause flooding, which could end up killing somebody. And you will get the consequences. On July 1, the Nigerian Meteorological Agency issued an alert on its X handle, predicting a significant surge in rainfall intensity and frequency across northern and north central states. The agency cautioned citizens to brace for more downpours in the coming days, urging everyone to stay informed with weather updates and take necessary precautions. Despite the challenges, the resilient spirit of Lagos remains unshaken as residents eagerly await decisive action from the government to rescue their state. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. Quite sad pictures there. I mean, it's really sad that Lagos has to go through this all the time. We know the commissioner has said work is on to address this menace, especially on the island. How quickly should we expect to see results of the ongoing work? Because the rains are coming, whether we like it or not. Um, Felicity, I would respond by saying that the damage that has been done in terms of uh, our drainages is quite a lot. So if we say how quickly will be cleared, I cannot categorically answer the question, but I do know that the government has started putting in work to make sure that we alleviate all of these issues for the citizens. For now, we are the um, ambassadors of our own areas and make sure that we take care when it comes to our environmental sanitation. All right, Bettina, thank you very much for that report. Thank you for listening. To security matters now, the... Security situation across Nigeria topped the agenda at the National Assembly on Wednesday, with lawmakers shocked over suicide bombing attacks that took place in Gwaza town, Boronu State, on Saturday, 29th June. At the Red Chamber, for instance, debates at plenary were on for several hours, with the lawmakers declaring that the country was on fire because its security system had collapsed. The lawmakers blamed the recent suicide bombings in Gwaza town on a failure of intelligence on the part of security forces. These were the sequel to a motion moved by Senator Ali Ndume on a suicide attack in Gwaza Bronu State by Boko Haram insurgents. President, if we have been talking about insecurity, government out, government in. Week out, week in. Month in, month out. Year in, year out. And we are still confronted with the menace of frequent attacks on our communities and the killing of vulnerable, defenseless civilians. Then, Mr. President, we want to ask ourselves the salient questions and then appeal to government to take the bull by the horn and be the government that will solve the problem of insecurity in Nigeria. Previous service chiefs diverted money to build the universities in their various communities. Those are the kind of resources that should have been used to procure modern technology. And to think that money was being diverted to non-essentials. And as we speak, those institutions are not teaching anything about security. They are just another glorified university. At least we have brought up something very serious here, that we should also employ a lot of technology. The technology do not need to be physically there. We can monitor from miles away to know when there is likely 
uh, going to be an uh, infraction in security. And uh, also, uh, the, what happened there could also be described as failure of intelligence. Because we have so many suicide bombers gathering together, it means we've not penetrated their camps. Otherwise, we would have known that they were going to strike. So uh, preventing security must also be emphasized. Female police officers across the African continent have been tasked to build networks of collaboration so as to help contribute to policing on the continent and tackle crime and criminality. This was made known at the ongoing conference in Abuja, organized by the International Association of Women Police in Africa. Amadine Uyi reports. The members of the talk table. The conference had in attendance female representatives from police services across Africa. Stakeholders in attendance say the conference will help resolve issues of gender disparity in security services, build networks for collaboration and unity among female police officers across the continent. This conference brings together outstanding women police officers in law enforcement and law enforcement officials from across Africa and beyond. It aims to strengthen unity, enhance capabilities, and provide invaluable networking opportunities for women in policing within the African region. Policy Other notable female personalities present commended their efforts aimed at bringing women from across the continent to deliberate on improving security and reducing crime. There are many threats, there are many challenges, there are many consequences in the field that you've chosen to serve. But as beautiful as you are in your uniforms this morning, I pray that the beauty comes from within and that you remain committed to securing the peace of our countries, of our communities, of our families. This gathering is not just a testament to the remarkable achievements of women in law enforcement, but also a commitment to the continued progress and empowerment of women in this crucial field. As we come together to share knowledge, experiences, and best practices, let us reaffirm our collective resolve to promote safety, justice, and empowerment in our respective countries to demonstrate the saying, anything a man can do, a woman can do it much, much better. The Inspector General of Police says that the deliberations by female police officers will help reposition efforts aimed at tackling insecurity. Policing in Africa faces unique challenges from transnational crime to domestic violence, demanding nuanced approaches. The collective wisdom and experiences shared by the women police officers present today will be crucial in crafting effective culturally sensitive solutions. The conference, which is hosted by Nigeria, is organized by the International Association of Women Police in Africa. The Nigeria Police Force also launched its gender policy to promote women inclusion in all aspects of its operations. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. We are gender sensitive. Thank you, Amadin. Senators from the Southeast have pleaded with President Bola Tinubu to order the release of the detained leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Namde Kanu. Led by Senator Eyin Nanya Baribe, the lawmakers claimed that unless Kanu is released, the social and economic activities in the Southeast region will continue to be stagnant. The senators held a closed-door meeting with the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Latif Fagbemi, where they are later to the Nigerian leader on the release of Kanu was delivered for onward passage to the presidency. Addressing journalists after the meeting, Abaribe, who spoke on behalf of his colleagues, lamented that the economy and social life in the region had suffered enough due to the continued incarceration of the Biafra nation agitator. Former Speaker of Nigeria's House of Representatives, Yakubu Dogara, has dismissed claims that lawmakers are overpaid, saying their monthly take-home pay is inadequate to sustain them. The former speaker, while speaking during the House of Representatives' open week session to mark their first legislative year anniversary, 
says that there is a need to clear the air over the take-home pay of federal lawmakers. I don't know whether they have increased it, Mr. Speaker, but when I was there, my salary was not up to 400,000 naira a month. So a young man in my constituency said, what is this thing about number four in Nigeria? You mean this is your salary? I can even hire you to work for me. So, you see, even when we talk about the allowances that people think they are homongous, too much money. Mr. Speaker, forgive me, the House will forgive me. Let me say this, and I'm saying it because it is the truth. My allowances, everything as a speaker then, was 25 million naira. I don't know if al Haji Atiku is here. He was my accountant. I asked him, open an account for this money because I know that this money is not mine. Expectation from the constituents, expectation even from the members that think, oh, you are face among equals, so you should have more than the equal. And honestly speaking, there was never a time I took one naira out of that account home. To one of our headline stories tonight, the Oshu State Governor Ademola Dileke has announced the suspension of his senior special assistant on civil societies, Emmanuel Adebisi. The reason behind the suspension was not stated in a statement signed by Dileke spokesman, Olawale Rashid. However, it said the chief of staff to the governor, Kazim Akile, would investigate Adebisi and report back to the governor. But Adebisi, in a Facebook post, gave a hint as to why he was suspended. In the post, Adebisi denied the alleged diversion of 70 bags of rice meant for distribution to members of the civil society groups in the state during the last Salah and insisted that he remained part of the Adeleke's administration. Coming up, House of Representatives begin review of the Oron Saye report. That's after the break. If you've just joined us, you're watching tonight. A reminder of our top stories. Commuters stranded as heavy downpour floods Lagos State. Southeast Senators urge President Tinubu to release Namdi Kanu. Oshu State Governor suspends Senior Special Assistant on Civil Societies for alleged misconduct. And four Chinese killed in a Democratic Republic of Congo militia attack. All right, still talking governance, Nigeria's House of Representatives says that it has identified a total of 1,310 ministries, departments, and agencies of government which needs to be scrapped or merged to resolve issues of duplication of functions and inefficiency. This was made known by Chairman of the House Special Committee on Restructuring of Government Agencies and Commissions. My colleague, Doug Joseph, tells us more. The recent announcement by the federal government to implement the Stephen Oron Saye report, expected to reduce the cost of governance, has recently generated diverse reactions. The report, which was published in 2012, highlighted several recommendations aimed at restructuring government agencies to enhance efficiency and reduce cost. Uh, the fact that the Oron Saye report has been uh, approved and adopted by council today does not mean that people will lose their jobs. All those who are employed, uh, whether they have been moved, subsumed, or scrapped, will find accommodation with that, with, within relevant uh, government agencies. Nobody is going to lose his job. Nigeria's parliament has joined the conversation, saying it is important to revisit the recommendations, as well as other white papers, to ensure they align with current realities and changing needs of society. The world is evolving rapidly, and it is crucial 
that our government agencies and commissions are structured in a way that enables them to deliver on their mandates effectively and efficiently. Through this review process, we aim to identify redundancies, duplications, inefficiencies, and areas of improvement within the federal government agencies and commissions. Lawmakers say they will conduct a thorough review and call on stakeholders to engage with the parliament to make inputs that will improve the process. And we are now open to taking memoranda from all concerned ministries, individuals, departments, agencies, parastasals, and uh, everyone. They add that the essence of the review is to ensure that the report, which was received by the federal government about 12 years ago, when implemented, will meet current realities. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. To discuss this, I'm joined by public affairs analyst Jide Ojo. Jide, it's good to have you on the news. Thanks for giving us your time. The, the report does estimate potential cost savings. But can the committee quantify the expected financial benefits of implementing the report's recommendations in today's economic climate? Thank you, Felicity. I, I, I think um, there is no gain saying the fact that the whole essence of having uh, Steve Barossa's report uh, being implemented uh, 12 years after it was uh, initially submitted was uh, to act as a cost saving measures so that government can reduce cost of governance substantially. And uh, I, I, I was not naive to see the kind of pushback that is taking place from the affected uh, ministries, departments, and agencies uh, that are now saying, no, uh, please don't scrap us, don't do this, don't do that. Because the, the review that the House of Reps wants to undertake now is premature. This is a report that has been lying fallow since 2011. Why did they, they have been parliament since that time? Why did none of them even call for the implementation or review of the report? And then on March 7 this year, the president gave a, um, the president gave a uh, 12 weeks ultimatum to the secretary to the federal government. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what's his name, Senator George Ackerman, uh, who led the implementation committee that uh, within 12 weeks, that 12 weeks has since lapsed. And many Nigerians are concerned that uh, uh, it would be like uh, a, a disobedience to presidential order if this did not come true. Uh, yes, I quite agree that uh, at this very critical period, losing a job is, uh, is going to be very painful, even though uh, at the committee on that, that submitted the white paper said, oh, there will be no job loss and all of that. I knew that they were just trying to calm freight naps. There is no way you will implement that kind of merger uh, that there will be no job loss. But the most important thing is the overarching uh, benefit to the country. And that's why I said, yes, it's a good step, it's a step in the right direction to reduce the cost of governance on the side of ministries, departments, and agencies. But it should not just be civil servants, it should cut across. We do not need the kind of, uh, the number of ministries that Tenuba administration itself has created, uh, additional five or seven ministries that I created on assumption of office last year. We do not need 48 ministers. We do not even need the number of um, federal lawmakers that, that we have. What are we doing with 109 senators? What are we doing with 360? But let, let's members? let's look at the merging of um, agencies. The report proposes 29 agencies to be merged, but how will the committee assess the effectiveness of these measures in achieving cost reduction, for instance, and improving service delivery in the long term? Are there maybe metrics in place to track progress? I should think so, Felicity. I should think that there will be, there will be KPIs and key performance indicators to know uh, to track performances of these merger institutions. And in any event, um, 
it's normal public service uh, rules that even if your agency is not much, even if they, they are, you are not affected by the Orosai report, it then doesn't mean that you have escaped the acts. Uh, even in the existing uh, NGs, uh, people are being retrenched, or people can be retrenched, whether at the federal or state civil service. The government can say we no longer need your service. I uh, mean, uh, it's not mandatory that you must serve for 60 years. Uh, the redundancy, there's something called redundancy. So if, if, you, if you are not performing, you can be asked to leave. So there are so many reasons why people lose their jobs. But yes, the cost-benefit analysis has to be done. Uh, there must be a matrix in place that tracks the key performance indicators. How are we, what exactly in Naira and Copa have we been able to save by uh, implementing this Toronto report? 29 is just on the low side. If you go back to the 2011 report, it, it recommended far higher number of uh, agencies to be managed. But because of the lobbying by the heads of these ministries, departments, and agencies, that's why the number was uh, thrown down to 29. Even these 29 now are kicking and lobbying and uh, engaging in high wire politics to see whether they can uh, stave off the acts of Damocles from, uh, from swinging on their head. But um, we, we wait to see how this whole thing will pan out eventually. Indeed. Um, I mean, it, it didn't start today. Let's hope this time there will be actions that will come from this latest review. Thank you very much, Ajide, for speaking with us. Always a pleasure, Philip. Now, residents and indigenous of communities traversing the Umopara Amachara Imo River Road have asked the Abu State government to ensure that compensations are duly paid to those whose buildings will be affected by the proposed road expansion. Abu State has announced plans to begin reconstructing the road, which is the second phase of the road expansion from Abia Tower to the Imo Abia boundary by Obowo. New Center's Chiwe Ugele has details. The speed of work and successful completion of the Osam Mission Hill Road, now renamed Aguirre Boulevard, is the reason a lot of people support the proposed expansion despite the possible destruction of some property. It took the Abia State government less than one year to expand the 6.7 kilometer Aguirre Boulevard. Although government is yet to say when work could begin on the road, it is certain that the expansion must happen. The, uh, the design of one name of two other tower road is in progress. Um, enumeration and of structures within uh, the right of way on the Overeta Bridge to Umeka Junction is. The people who are indigenous and business owners in the area want government to be humane in its approach to the reconstruction. Any structure, the, 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 the development is affected. To my own, this, you know, government should uh, call them and they know their mind. Uh, if this is kind of um, compensation, uh, it's necessary so that the person will not have bitter mind against government. Atumato Ebasa Kosa, or Daisy Boma, and Akukeba and other governments, Basara, and then Koga, Meko Pandi, when a shop Monday when roller. So that Hana Ha, a Mizzi, Mizza Montagi, saying that one here we are Hagi, Jia, Trebos, or Haga, Hanora, and Mekweka, Ulina Batapana, Tebulo. Dika Emmer, Sai Dika Emmer, and the have to compensate the people that have building around, not just come and push down their structure or building on anyhow. Because many, many people receive that some people, they, 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 they buried their mothers or father around that place. And you can't just come and push down my building. I say, you don't give me anything. I can't, I, can't, I can't allow that. For the demolition and reconstruction to take place, the Ministry of Lands will need to conduct an enumeration of the structures.
to be affected and thereafter mark them to prepare the minds of those whose buildings will be pulled down. Even though the government has not yet made known the expected time of takeoff or completion of the 12-kilometer road, the people expect that the work will be expeditiously executed. In Omaha for New Central, Chinwe Ugele. The Senate has raised an alarm over the influx of substandard premium motor spirit, popularly known as petrol and automotive gas oil or diesel, into the Nigerian market. In a matter of urgent national importance, Senator Asukwo Ekbeong observed that on June 16, 2024, a report revealed that 12 diesel cargoes conveying a total of 660 kilotons of diesel were exported by refineries to offshore Lume, Togo, for further distribution to West African markets, mainly Nigeria. According to him, the quality of the said diesel was below the Nigerian standard in terms of flash and sulfur levels. The Senate then set up an ad hoc committee to launch an investigation into the continued importation. All sorts of money to maintenance of uh, Nigeria refineries. Now we have refineries that are working. And a Nigerian, a Nigeria who believes in the future of our country at a time when the pressure on foreign exchange is so strong that the Naira is permitted every day. A Nigeria find comfort in the words of this, in this particular paragraph, to continue to issue licenses for the importation of substandard, dangerous chemicals in the name of diesel. Mr. President, I want to say that we demand that we need a major reform. Ed must know the Nigerian Petroleum Corporation and even other agencies of the government that are serving with this responsibility. Because all these allegations is just one out of the numerous investigations we have to do in this sector. So I would be implying that we should do an holistic investigation. Because when we, by the time we start creating this notion at the committee level, there will be other issues that will come up. We have the one from Dangote, and then we are issuing licenses every day. As you open this open you see licenses to bring in what? Diesel. Bring it sure, bring it this, bring it that. We are very, very encouraging local production. America and many other countries do everything to protect their local production in order to save jobs. Still ahead, four Chinese nationals killed in DR Congo. We have details after the break. A militia attack on a mining site in the Gold Rititiri province has killed at least four Chinese nationals in the northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo. This is according to local sources. Several Congolese were also killed or injured in the attack, with some of them local sources attributes to a militia group, Kodeko, claiming to defend the interest of the Lendu tribe against the rival Hema tribe. Attacks on mining sites and convoys are common in Ituri and further south in the other gold-rich province of South Kivu, where there are many Chinese miners. Conflicts over gold between Congolese residents and Chinese miners are also common. It's now time to bring you the latest business stories from our business desk. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Talking business now, the Central Bank of Nigeria has issued a warning against the rejection of old series and lower denominations of U.S. dollars by regulated entities in the country. The bank has threatened to impose sanctions on lenders that refuse these currencies. 
The warning was contained in a circular dated June 27 and directed at deposit money banks, bureau de change operators and the general public. The strike at its Bafo Kang operations that had lasted for nearly a week. The strike, which began on June 27, primarily involved contractors at Impala Bafo Kang's BRPM operation demanding permanent positions. The company stated that through constructive engagements with employee representatives, the issues were resolved. As a result, normal attendance levels were observed at the north shaft starting from the morning shift. In Parla, along with its South African peers, Anglo-American Platinum and Simbaye Stillwater, has been grappling with a severe crisis and cost-cutting measures due to a significant drop in metal prices last year, leading to the elimination of thousands of jobs. We also tell you that ahead of the swearing-in ceremony of ministers in President Sir Ramaphosa's new unity government, the South African round experienced a strengthening on Wednesday. As 0741 GMT in the round was trading at 18.47 against the dollar, marking a 0.7% increase compared to its previous close. The round had a volatile week following the announcement of the new cabinet, which includes former opposition leader John Stenhausen of the Democratic Alliance. While the initial response from the markets was positive due to the perceived business-friendly cabinet, investor caution remains due to uncertainty surrounding the government of national unity's approach to reforms. The new cabinet ministers will be sworn in later in the day, and the stock market's top 40 index opened 1.3% higher. South Africa's benchmark 2030 government bond also showed strength, with the yield down 3.5 basis points to 9.91% during early deals. And that's all on business news. Many thanks for watching. I am Lee Kong on Nobanjo. Business News, in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Up next is Sports News. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. In sport, following our recent performances, African para beating champion Eniola Bolaji has now been ranked world number three in the women's singles SL3. Bolaji will represent Nigeria in the women's SL3 category at the forthcoming Paris 2024 Paralympic Games in France. She has been in Spain perfecting her skills ahead of the Paralympics. It will be recalled after the 2024 Spanish para beating international in April, the Badminton Federation of Nigeria and Badminton Confederation Africa through their special intervention secured the services of Coach Dina to further help in her preparations towards the summer games. Away from para badminton, now to weightlifting where the International Weightlifting Federation has confirmed the participation of two Nigerian weightlifters, Paula Shade Lawal in the 59 kilogram and Joy Ogbone 71 kilogram in the forthcoming Paris 2024 Olympic Games in France. According to the final Olympic qualification ranking, two-time Commonwealth Games champion Paula Shade Lawal is currently ranked 8 in the world in the women's 59 kilogram weight class. In the women's 71 kilogram class, two-time Commonwealth Games champion Joy Obone is ranked 9th in the world. President of the Nigerian Weightlifting Federation, Ibrahim Abdul, said that both athletes had been in camp for a month before the commencement of the federal government campaign exercise. Abdul revealed that the coaches and technical crew are working around the clock to ensure Nigeria returns with medals from the 2024 Olympics. And out of football, former Super Eagles coach Finidi George has signed a two-year contract with the MPFL club side Rivers United. The former international winger was presented to the media on Wednesday evening in Port Harcourt. He previously handled another MPFL side, Ayimba, leading them to their ninth title last year. The 53-year-old replaces Tali Guba, who was in charge of the Pride of Rivers for over 16 years. Finidi quit his post as Super Eagles coach last month after 2026 FIFA World Cup qualifiers against South Africa and Benin Republic saw Nigeria drop to second from bottom in Group C of the qualifying series. Rivers United finished a disappointing 11th this past season. Meanwhile, the official unveiling is billed for Thursday, July 4th, 2 p.m. at the Shark Stadium in Port Harcourt. And to wrap up sports update, ahead of the Paris 2024 Olympics campaign, Nigeria women's national team Super Falcons will face a big test 
when they square up against their Canadian counterparts in an international friendly on the 17th of July in Sevilla, Spain. Both countries will be meeting in a friendly duel for the second time on Spanish soil after earlier meeting prior to the France 2019 Women's World Cup with the Falcons losing 2-1. Both teams also faced off last summer at the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand, which ended in a goalless draw in Brisbane. Head coach Randy Waldrum confirmed the fixture while announcing his 22-woman squad on Wednesday and revealing the team's preparation schedule. Nigeria's national women's team returns to the Olympics after a 16-year absence and will open their campaign against Brazil at the Stade de Bordeaux on the 25th of July. They will then face reigning world champion Spain on the 28th of July before taking on the Nadeshiko of Japan on the 31st of July. Both matches will be played July against Spain and Japan respectively at the Stade de la Biojore in Nantes. And that's it on Sports Update and Favour Itwa. Sports Update brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. Now join our entertainment team for the latest in the world of entertainment. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. On Entertainment Tonight, music star Olamide Adedeji, known as Olamide, has achieved a new milestone with his hit single Metaverse, surpassing 1 million views on YouTube since its release on June 27, 2024. The song, which blends Afrobeats and hip-hop, has become a fan's favorite and showcases Olamide's enduring influence in the Nigerian music industry. With a career spanning over a decade, Olamide is one of Nigeria's most successful artists, known for critically acclaimed albums like Rhapsody and YBNL, and collaborations with international artists such as Fino and Wizkid. He has also received numerous awards. The success of Metaverse highlights Olamide's continued relevance and popularity in the music scene. Producers of the movie Rost may lose a $1.6 million economic incentive crucial for meeting financial obligations to the family of the cinematographer, Helena Hodgkins, who was fatally shot by Alec Baldwin during rehearsal in 2021. New Mexico tax authorities denied the incentive application and the producers have until late July to appeal. The denied incentive was intended to finance a legal settlement with Hodgkin's family, which has faced delays prompting the family to consider further legal actions. Meanwhile, Baldwin faces an involuntary manslaughter trial next week and the film's production in Montana, including Baldwin and director Joel Souza, concluded last year. New Mexico's film incentive program, one of the most generous in the U.S., is under scrutiny and the denial of Rust application and others could impact the local industry. That's all on Entertainment Tonight. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. Moving away from entertainment, the hashtag Uniben takes center stage on our trending stories online as Benin Lagos Express Road by Uniben Main Gate was blocked by protesters over power outage in the campus hostels for more than a month. A lot of people took to social media to express their concerns. Let's take a look at some tweets. At comedian Danny Boy, there's a protest against the constant power outage in the school and military presence was called upon. As a Nigerian, you know why. At 00315X, big 2024, and we're still having light issues in Uniban, a month to exams and we don't have light, and you expect students to come out and write exams. Hostelites can't even get water to have their bath or cook. At Chongais, why would they spoil government property? This is no longer a peaceful protest. They know why they don't have light. Instead of going to Nepa office, they are destroying government property. At Otekario Ogenero, they need to pay attention to the students before it gets out of hand. And that's all on What's Trending Tonight.
And that's all tonight. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Commuters stranded as heavy downpour floods Lagos State. Southeast senators urge President Tinubu to release Namdi Kanu. Oshu State Governor has suspended senior special assistant on civil societies over alleged misconduct. We also brought you news that four Chinese have been killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo militia attack. We would like to hear from you. Please send your eyewitness report to the number showing now on your screen. You can follow us on socials at News Central TV. Or you could choose to watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and on YouTube. As always, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.